Hello again. Welcome to another edition of Arts and Ideas. I'm Sue Swinand. And today we are in the studio of Toby Sisson, who is a very fine multimedia artist. She is also assistant professor of uh, studio arts at uh, Clark University. And she directs the Schilt Camp Gallery at Clark University, which has been putting on some fabulous shows over the last few years. So I congratulate you on all your work there. And thank you for having us today in your workspace. Thank you for coming. I really, really appreciate having you here. My pleasure. I, I, when I say my pleasure, I mean it because I've admired her work for many years now, ever since you came into the area. And seeing her work in person, I realize how diverse it is and how many different materials you use and how you combine them in such extraordinary ways. Do you consider yourself a painter first? Um, I think I consider myself an artist first, and that allows me the latitude to really work in any kind of media that I'd like. Um, but primarily I work with paint, so I suppose a painter is a fair estimation of what I do. But I also do a lot of drawing and a lot of printmaking as well, and I try to integrate those ways of working, those processes together. Sometimes in one singular piece you'll see all of that going on, and other times it will be in, you know, reflected in a, in a series or in a show. Mm -hmm. I noticed too that so much of your work really has a sculptural aspect to it because it, it has a thingness where <laughs> there's something you can grab hold of. The image is like a three-dimensional image. And I'm very intrigued by that because it has such a presence. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I completely agree with what you said. It has a thingness. I, I think about that often. Um, and sometimes it's a little hard to pin down, but I'm interested in materials, process, the uh, becoming that the artwork goes through. Um, so this idea of something that feels a bit sculptural, I like working on that edge where something, even though it might be grounded in my background in painting or printmaking or drawing, also takes on an object type form and can seem somewhat sculptural. That allows me an opportunity perhaps to engage with the viewer in a slightly different way, push out into the space uh, that's the viewers to engage all sides of a work. So sometimes I work on the edges and sometimes I allow myself an opportunity to create images that also include even the back on occasion. But for the most part, it's two dimensional, but I am pushing into the other realm of thingness mm -hmm. and object. This piece exceptionally uh, shows that uh, th three dimensional quality because I feel like I can see into the body of this piece. And could you show the audience this, the sides and the way Sure, they're... absolutely. This comes off the wall pretty easily. In my studio space, I like to make things um, mobile. Ah, so this is, as you can see, on a wooden frame. Uh, would you call this a frame or a Yeah, uh, I create, I, I often build a brace panel. And it's funny because this one's actually hanging upside down. I had originally envisioned it this way, but found that over time I actually enjoyed the composition more this way. Again, I allow myself the latitude to move things around. It could work and in have a little of surprise. Ways. Yes, exactly. Kandinsky style, <laughs> where he walked into the studio and <laughs> yeah. saw it upside down and waha. <laughs> it's finally right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. But do you see how she uses the sides of the panel and uh, the surface of this is so it's kind of like Swiss cheese, it's kind of, or I don't know, some exotic cheese that I don't know, but it has that feeling of being alive, something from nature, something from the organic world. Mm -hmm. Well, I think of it as having a skin-like surface. Yeah. So the pockmarks that I think you're identifying really to me almost remind me of the porosity of the material. It feels porous. Um, and this is encaustic, so it's a combination of several materials, primarily encaustic, which is pigmented beeswax, has a little bit of Dharma resin in it to make it harder, um, and to add a little bit more luster and shine to it as well. But there's also graphite that's been rubbed into the surface and charcoal in some places. I do some scribing or cutting in that also allows you to see into the surface of the work, give it a little bit more dimensionality. Where, can I touch it? Yeah, absolutely. So you can actually feel the raised and cut 
line that's there. The line is real. It's a thing. It's right there on the surface of into the painting, really. Same thing here, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can feel that, like a little zipper. Yeah, so I'm creating patterns, scribing, notching into it. I think about it um, as an extension of the drawing and the pattern making happens in that way, but I suppose it is kind of a sculptural practice because it allows me to get that dimension in there so that things feel a little bit three-dimensional, oh, even though they're yeah. on a two-dimensional surface, and they're pushed out from the wall a bit as well. I love the intentional pattern and the random organic pattern, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of play of intention and chance. Exactly. Very, very lovely. Yeah. And I've embedded other materials as well. In addition to the charcoal and the graphite and the oil and the wax, there's also bits of paper that have been cut and embedded into the wax. It has the ability, I think, to really incorporate a lot of different materials seamlessly. And that's, that's always... That's the beauty of the wax is you can embed into it and cut it into it and mm -hmm. uh, let's look at this one too that's uh, really quite oh it looks like a brick it looks like a chunk of concrete something primordial dug out of the <laughs> it's so physical yeah like the first one that we looked at this is also on a, on a hand-built uh, brace panel so I've constructed a space that feels that it's it's got a little bit of depth and the heft that you're talking about and then layered on top of that wax and then the pores that you see give it that sense that there's a sort of solidity to it it starts to take on the property of almost a ceramic or a stone like presence mm. um, and then the markings that you see the black here is graphite Mm. And then that's been created wow. in a way that makes it feel as if that's really part of the whole material, as opposed to it just has something a that's very different. It has a very different finish from the other piece. This one being much more, I don't know, elegant. This one very much more rough and crude and raw, mm -hmm. like it's a stone plinth or something yeah. from some ancient kind of thing. I don't know. Well, this one I've polished up to a little bit higher shine with my own palm. Ah. The wax allows you to buff it so that um, you can get a higher shine. This one is simply left matte. I prefer to have a little bit more of that gravelly texture that the charcoal has or the graphite has innately. Isn't it interesting how material like graphite or the, the surface of the wax when it has that kind of smoky bloom, how they express feelings and content in the material itself, in mm -hmm. the texture. Yeah, I think it's there's a, a great deal of emotion that's embedded in material. So I'm careful about the substances that I use. They're often organic, but not always. I'm very fond of working with ink and graphite and charcoal and paper is a love of mine as well. Is this ink over here? Yes, as a matter of fact, this is. Uh, bring that one this way so we can take a better look at it. I'll hold it and you talk. Sure. Um, this is also on a brace panel, not one that I built, so it's a little bit more shallow. Um, however, it's a combination of an ink drawing. I tend to think of this actually as a drawing process. Even, even though, though you're using puddles. Even though I'm using puddles and I'm using a brush, I think when I'm engaging with it in the creation process of this particular series, I was thinking about drawing. Um, <clears throat> although I might be convinced otherwise, I suppose, because there's areas that feel as if they're more about mass than line. So it's sort of treading the line between those two practices. Um, so this is an India ink on paper, and that paper has then been mounted on the wood panel and then receiving a skim coat of wax to make it sort of um, a surface that's protected. So you couldn't go in and alter this necessarily. That's another nice thing is with the wax over the paper, you don't have to do glazing with glass. No, exactly. You can have a bit more contact with the surface of this because it won't be hurt by your hands. It's not going to be disturbed by light. Um, it allows you a sense of this of the surface of the drawing or the painting to feel a little more immediate. It's not, yes. there's no barrier of a frame yes. or a mat, or yes. as you say, glass that interrupts the viewer's interaction. And with again, the piece. it's this objectness. It's this line that exists on this surface and is so present. It's wonderful. I love the organic way too. As a person who does a lot of painting with water, I just love the way you're allowing the water to create these wonderful little events mm -hmm. in, the, in the puddle. 
Well, as you said earlier, it's always a negotiation between the intentional mark and the chance that happens. Um, you know you can certainly guide things if you've worked with the material for a long time. You have a sort of um, informed intuition about what might happen. Um, but there's always a little bit of surprise in there. You don't know exactly where a bloom is going to go or how something is going to bleed. Um, you don't always know the interaction of the materials, although you can guesstimate that to a large degree. So I really enjoy working on that edge where I'm negotiating between the material taking on a sort of life of its own and determining things about the composition and my exerting my own will over that as well. This one actually went through several different um, sort of processes in order to come to its final state at this point. Um, it started out as an encaustic uh, monotype, which again is printmaking, um, but using encaustic pigments instead of ink, um, working with a hot plate that allows us to transfer um, the uh, composition to the paper. Uh, one of the nice things about working with wax is I can print on both sides of the paper. That allows so a wait a minute. So you're painting on the on a plate and then mm -hmm. putting the paper on a hot plate and exactly. picking up the image. Exactly. Got it. So I'm transferring an image as you would in a mono in a monoprint or a monotype, but I'm using heat instead of pressure. So not a traditional etching press where something rolls through. So the wax the is heat. melted on the plate. She puts the paper on the plate, and bingo, the hot wax gets picked up by the paper. Mm -hmm. And it's a printmaking technique because like all printmaking, you're, you're transferring an image. You're taking it um, and you're making something that's potentially repeatable, but it's a monoprint so, or monotype, so it's not repeatable in this instance, but it shares other similarities with printmaking techniques. You're starting with an image and then transferring it to the paper. I always was thinking of you as kind of a printmaker, you know, because your work has something about that, well, even the black and white of it has a print kind of quality. But um, I forget what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, on the uh, monoprint plate and on uh, an encaustic uh, plate that you're painting on, there's that wonderful ability to move everything around. Mm -hmm. It slides around the plate. It's like doing a finger painting where you can slide the material all over or scrape it. Or mm -hmm. So yeah. it has a lot of potential for discovery. Exactly. Um, I like that fluidity. So even when I'm working with uh, paint or um, ink, or even drawing. I'm looking for ways to increase that fluidity. Um, and then there's hand coloration here. So there is charcoal added in these instances and those were those layers were laid on after the original print was created. Um, and then it's mounted on the braced panel again and then covered in wax. So there's wax embedded in it and wax on top as well. I love the subtlety of her colors. Uh, you might think of some of these as being purely black and white, but this one, for example, has this little coolness in this kind of lavendery tone or the ochre here and there, a little greenish over. So it has a very, very much for me, a feeling of real life and real light and experience of the world. It, 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 it exists like the light in this room, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, with a little bit of temperature in the color. Yeah, I'm absolutely interested in the duality of black and white. I like seeing light emerging from the darkness. Um, and of course, as you pointed out, that brings me back to sort of the sensibilities of printmaking and drawing, I think. Um, but I do enjoy including a little bit of subtle color. Um, but I like that to be very, very subtle. That's not mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. how I want my compositions to be formed. I'm mm -hmm. interested in shape and line, perhaps more than I am with composing with color. Well, you know, I was thinking about your line and how wonderful it is, uh, especially that I re always think of that piece with the string that seems to, mm -hmm. looks like a knot of strings or something. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I also realized how important shape is in your work mm -hmm. and how much meaning you cull out of very simple organic shapes. And mm -hmm. uh, that's the mystery, I think, of how, how visual elements communicate to us uh, in a very, very, very subliminal way. 
I think so. Um, because I'm keeping everything somewhat desaturated and subtle and color isn't a dominant force, you're correct. I am using shape to communicate. It has a metaphorical presence. We can feel movement. We can feel energy. As you noticed, um, there's an emotional content earlier in shape. We can feel entering or leaving, we exactly. rising, falling. Exactly. All of those kinds of things are in, engaged when you're dealing with shape primarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, tell us a little bit about what you're trying to communicate, if you could. I, I understand from the even the dual ca canvases or a number of your pieces are diptychs, and um, I think that is, is has a significance in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would like to hear you talk a little bit more about the content. Absolutely. Um, I think in my chosen palette, primarily black and whites or something that's very monochromatic. Um, I think as you point out in working in diptychs, working in two panels, working in repetitive shape, repetitive line, I'm thinking about relationships all the time. Duality is a big part of that. Sometimes it's oppositional forces that are examined through contrast, the high contrast of black and white. Um, sometimes it's about shifting relationships, so you'll see shuttle, su subtle gradients when something is moving and traveling in from black to gray to white or maybe emerging black back into black again. Um, so I'm interested in the relationships that these shapes can have with one another. And of course those can have larger implications. One can see these as being metaphors for what happens in the larger world as well. Mm -hmm. so, so the idea of metaphor that arises with the uses of your uh, values and shapes and lines is really communicating your meaning. Were you ever uh, involved with the, uh, the, the kind of feminist aesthetic? Um, not directly. I don't think I'm quoting anything um, directly from sort of feminist theory. I am very often thinking about racial politics, um, perhaps um, a bit more near and dear to my own heart um, in my family background, my ancestry, my history is thinking about that duality. So that comes up, I think, as a, maybe a subtext in the work. Mm -hmm. I might be more aware of that um, mm -hmm. because I'm seeing myself reflected in this work. And people might not know that you have a heritage of German ancestry, African American, African -American. ancestry, and Cherokee. So I'm biracial. And I grew up in um, a family with lots and lots of different kinds of ethnic traditions that were carried through everything from the way we lived and ate. and uh, That was part and parcel of the household. Um, and I think that that shows up in the work. That's why I'm thinking about relationships and interactions and contrast, where things meet and perhaps oppose or don't blend and where things merge and do become like the other. So this idea of creating a, a bit of a pluralistic world, even within the picture plane, is something that I'm engaged with and I think and, always have been. And how disparate elements can be synthesized or in harmony mm -hmm. or not. Exactly. Yes. And, and that has global implications. It isn't just my own family story. That might be what I'm pulling this content It's our from. nation's exactly. our but that's, nation's that's, story. That's globalism. That's the that's world. Right. So it has that bigger connection. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your background. I, I know you're from the Midwest. I am actually. Uh, I was raised in Minneapolis and St. Paul area, originally from Chicago, but I think of the Twin Cities in Minnesota as home. That's, that's where I'm from. And I've been in New England for about five years now, almost exactly five years to the day. And what brought you to New England? That was your Clark uh, engagement? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I came to New England to teach at Clark University in central Massachusetts in Worcester. And um, I love working at Clark. I love the students. I really enjoy the program. It's a research-driven institution, so uh, we really engage with big ideas and bring those into the classroom. What are you teaching at Clark? Uh, I teach in the Studio Art Program in the Visual and Performing Arts Department. And I'm teaching currently uh, drawing, painting, and a couple different kinds of drawing, a couple different kinds of painting. I also teach Studio Topics, which is the capstone course for the major of Studio Art. And I teach uh, Senior Thesis, which is the exhibition course when students are just about to graduate. 
finish their time at Clark and their studio art majors, uh, we put together an exhibition for them. It's kind of the culmination of their work as and students. And that's done in the uh, Schilt Camp Gallery? It's in the Schilt Camp Gallery. So I direct the gallery and then when I'm teaching thesis, I don't every semester, but when I do, um, it gives me the opportunity to really be able to educate them a lot about gallery culture and how to hang a show properly, yes. all of the ingredients that go One into that. One of the things I was really impressed with uh, on various occasions was the fact that they have the students select and curate the shows and hang the shows and all kind really mm -hmm. and talk about the work and it's it's a wonderful hands-on kind of program. Tell me more about the gallery work. Absolutely. Um, as director of the gallery I work with student interns and so if a student is an intern and that's a process that we have them go through we select certain students that appropriate for that work. We really like it to be majors, we like it to be students that have a certain amount of experience in graphic design and certain other things that we're looking for. Um, and then with those interns I teach them how to curate a show, which is lots of ingredients. That's selecting the artist, selecting the artwork, hanging the show, arranging the show, putting together the publicity, uh, managing the events of an opening reception. Sometimes we've had other what a events wonderful associated. opportunity to have hands-on experience like that. Mm -hmm. It's great. Um, it's a wonderful exhibition uh, opportunity for them inside the school and it also prepares them for work outside um, mm -hmm. post-college. So we've had students go on and work uh, as interns in other galleries and museum situations um, and, and the skills that they learn at the Schultkamp Gallery are directly transferable. When you, uh, we talk about Clark as being a research university, uh, tell, tell us about that and also I would like to know more about how your teaching impacts your own work and your own life and your own thought mm -hmm. and so forth. Well, absolutely. In addition to what I do with the studio art program, I'm also uh, largely engaged with the Higgins School of Humanities at Clark. And that gives me an opportunity to work with lots of different topics. So each semester we have a symposium in Higgins School and we deal with a big issue. So we might talk about technology, we might talk about the environment, and we're always able to integrate one of those big symposium topics with something that's happening in the visual arts. We'll invite in um, an artist as a guest speaker, perhaps for an exhibition. I get an opportunity to work with those artists, sometimes even suggest or bring in artists of my choosing. And I also get to bring the students in to have an opportunity to engage with those artists. So practicing artists who are creating work in the world is a way we want them to understand the research aspects of the it's Higgins School. It's wonderful cross-pollination between disciplines at the university. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that much must be very enriching for you as well. Absolutely. You know, art can be about anything. So um, it can be about one's own personal experience, but it really is important to engage with the larger ideas in the world. So if it is about environmentalism or if it is about um, identity politics, anything that's happening currently in the world, we try to engage those issues and create opportunities for students to think about those things through the lens of art making. Does the teaching really influence you in your own work? I think the way that teaching impacts my own practice would be um, it's always a motivation to stay current. Um, one can't get too settled in their own practice. If you're having to engage with students who are bringing in fresh ideas, they want to be engaged with what's absolutely new and current and happening, I think it becomes a way to stay um, perhaps really involved with what's up to the minute, what's mm -hmm. happening now. Mm -hmm. I always want to be able to bring to my students what's absolutely at the leading edge. Mm -hmm. um, and so that requires that I stay in that as well. Because there you're on the edge of discovery. Exactly. It's research. It's thinking about the issues of our time and mm -hmm. how artists, you were saying before, which I really liked, she mentioned the fact that the artist is the former of culture, you were saying, something like exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, we create culture. And this is what I want my students to understand about art making. It's really more than learning technical skill. It's not about decoration. It's not about what's right or what's good. It's really about thinking, critical thinking, and about the process of creating culture. And so that's what we do as a research in institution, and that's what I want my students to have as a takeaway. Mm -hmm. 
You've been doing something interesting with your critiques with your students. Tell me about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is bringing in some of what I've learned in the Higgins School of Humanities. And they have a program that's called the Difficult Dialogues Program, where they take on large issues that are sometimes contentious, and they have interesting conversations about them. So they're not trying to prove something is right or wrong. They're not trying to persuade. They're really trying to unpack an idea and get it meaning and depth of meaning. And so I've taken that idea and brought it into my classroom and integrated it with the critique process. So rather than having students feel nervous about the judgment that's associated with critiques, they can perhaps feel a little liberated and maybe even empowered talking about the meaning of their work. We approach it from a completely different way, and I've learned that from dialogue. And to allow the artwork to prompt different responses and different questions instead of having the artwork be judged on a the sense of being right or wrong or... Absolutely, yes. absolutely. It's about a series of questions. It's about interrogating the work. It's about interrogating your practice, which is not meant to sound threatening at all. It's just really about getting a deep meaning. I love the idea of taking time to look at work. In the culture we live in, the, the time that we spend looking at something and actually engaging with it, and painting is like that. It's something you have to look at and let it come to you in little bits. And mm -hmm. the more you think and ask, the more you see. Yeah, so it's really a process of slowing down, exactly yes, what is. you're saying. Yes, it is. And it's something I fear that we lose. And another reason why I think the visual arts are so important and mm -hmm. uh, as, an, as a practice in our, in our education. Yeah, it's, it's a way to understand the world. You know, I often, uh, I want to tell people what your website is so that if you, uh, it's tobysisson.com. Correct. And uh, she has a wonderful website and you can go to her website and enjoy some of her fabulous titles and it'll really give you a way of spending time with her work and reading some of her titles, which I love. <laughs> and that's just another entree into the work which we didn't touch on at all but uh, I enjoyed the website very much and the other thing I wanted to mention before we run out of time is that you have an exhibition now at the Hunterton Museum in New Jersey. What, what yeah, is that? Exactly. Oh. Um, it's, it's titled Swept Away and I'm very happy to be in that show. It's with a number of other artists that are also working in encaustic um, in a myriad of different ways. So some sculptural work, a lot of printmaking, painting. Uh, it's really a wonderful show and I'm excited to be at that museum. I would like to get down and see that. That's, uh, I haven't been down that way for a while. It's in Clinton, New Jersey. Clinton, New Jersey and the de ending date is Yeah, that, uh, actually that runs all the way through the summer. So um, that uh, wraps up in September. Well, there's another opportunity for you when you're running down the, the uh, I-95. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think that's it for today, Toby, but I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed seeing your work and Thank getting you. to know you a little bit better and uh, seeing your fabulous studio and so forth. So thanks very much for having Thank us. Thank you for coming. And, uh, and I hope to see you for another edition of Arts and Ideas. Mm -hmm.